So this is me when I was a kid. Uh, and uh, when I was a kid, I was, I was kind of a pain. I was a bit of a handful. Um, for a couple of reasons. One, I tended to talk a lot, like all the time. Um, and two, and this one might resonate with some of the folks that are in this room, I had a tendency to break things a lot. Right? Like, I wouldn't mean to. I'd pick something up. I'd go to fiddle with it. And the next thing I know, the insides would just sort of fall out. And there you go. It was broken. Or I'd see something that said, under no circumstances should you ever do this with this thing. And I'd say, well, why not? Right? What, could, what could happen? And I would try. Uh, and for a variety of other reasons, I was challenging. Um, and I had an aunt. Ooh, ooh, is it? There we go. Uh, I had an aunt who I was very close with. Um, uh, whose name is Anne Scurry. This is what we called her. Uh, the story behind that's for another time. I only have 40 minutes today. You can find me in a bar. We'll talk about it. But her name was Anne Scurry. You'll have to take my word for it. Um, uh, she's, she's where I got that shirt. I don't know if you can see it from the back of the room. Can, can anybody read that? Yeah, it says, here comes trouble. That's right. And on the back, it said, there goes trouble. She got me this shirt. She also is where I got my talkativeness from. She liked to tell a good story. Um, and I was at her place when I was older, I was a teenager, and I was stepping through that doorway that's behind her now, and I, I was going over the gate, there was a dog gate there, and I, I went to step over, and I like, saw my cousin, if I remember right. Uh, and I said, oh, hey, how are you doing? It's good talking to you. And I caught my foot, gate went down, I fell on the table, I broke something, tore the molding clear off the wall. This is in the middle of a party, a big family gathering. Uh, and my aunt said, jeez, she said, I can't trust you to go five feet without breaking something. She's like, I swear to God, if you can ever figure out how to make a career out of talking too much and breaking shit, you're going to do great. And here we are, <laughs> some 40 years later. <laughs> um, so speaking of breaking things, things we fiddle around with, uh, we're going to talk today through uh, what's really kind of an example and a case study. Um, I'm going to talk a lot about this issue with Google, I will say right up front. The vast majority of the things I'm going to talk about have been fixed, they don't work anymore, which is cool. I'm very glad to hear it. Um, so we're going to talk through this, but more as a case study. Like This is uh, a little less, really, in my opinion, about the specifics of this issue, although they are fun and a little weird at times, um, but more about the kind of lessons we can draw out from this. Um, and one of the big, big ones being around trust and understanding what you trust. How many people know what this is, what one of these dialogue boxes is? Yell it out. Go ahead. It's fine. So off. Right. It's right in the name of this presentation. Fantastic. Yeah, this is an OAuth consent dialog box, right? These are all of the internet. It's the sort of underpinning of lots and lots of different things. In the modern era, if you want to give anything access to some resources you've got somewhere, um, chances are you're using OAuth to do it. It's better than giving out your username and password, which incidentally is what we used to do, right? Like, it used to be that if you wanted to give access to an application, you give it your username and password, you could do everything you could do. This is way better than that. <clears throat> um, but there's a lot of kind of implied trust. Uh, I'll ask one more question. How many people, if I, if I use the phrase and ask you to fill in the blank, OAuth is a blank framework, you would know what the answer is? Anybody? Good. It's supposed to be an authorization framework, right? We're going to ignore like the OIDC, the other things that have been built on top. At its core, it's an authorization framework, right? It's a way to grant access post. Authentication, it assumes authentication of the user, and it's a way for the user to grant access afterwards. This is mostly true, but there's a little bit inside, right? Which is that bit up there where it says the application name. Applications, the things that you're granting access to, do actually have to authenticate during this process. It's not really something we talk about very much, but it's true. Uh, and there's a lot of implied trust in here. And that's really the big kind of takeaway. If you're, if you're out of the anybody, eng management people, suits, I was a suit for like five years. Um, now, this is mostly as dressed as I have to get, but uh, for the big high-level takeaway, um, this is really about understanding what you trust with your providers, with protocols, how things interact with each other. Um, I'm, I'm very fortunate to work at a place. I'm really excited to be able to talk about the things we're talking about. I work at a place that values data. We're a data-driven company. I work at Two Sigma. It's a, we call it a financial sciences company. Right? We, we talk about we derive value from the world's, world's data. We take a scientific approach to investment. And that all floods down through everything we do, engineering, security, everything. So in security, that translates into treating controls like hypotheses, not like a given, not like an axiom, like a hypothesis to be tested 
A vendor says they do a thing, or this thing works to block this. We believe the right thing to do is to go kick the tires and make sure that's actually true. It muddies the waters a little bit, admittedly, of the kind of classic shared security model, particularly when you're talking about a SaaS provider. But it is pretty important, particularly large modern providers where they have a foot in infrastructure, platform as a service, SaaS, right? And all those things kind of have to fit together. Well, those things fit together, things tend to get interesting. It's important that you understand where those trusts are. And maybe, as you'll learn from the end of this, maybe the thing you should trust is probably not native OAuth applications. And we'll talk a little bit about what native applications are in a second. But we're going to start with the demo. We're going to do it backwards. Usually demos go at the end, right? And do it backwards. Largely because this is how I got there. Um, the accidental part of this is I actually wasn't looking for security issues when I found this. I was messing around with uh, their hosted Jupyter Notebook service, and I noticed some weird interactions. When it wanted to interact with Drive, it didn't say it was collaboratory. It said it was something else. I thought that was a little weird. I didn't know anything about auth at the time, so I had to kind of figure it out. But that meant I started at more or less a fully functioning exploit, this application doing something that I didn't think it should. I had to work backwards to figure out what it was. So that's where you're all going to start out. I learned a lot of things when I was doing this. One of the things I learned, I'm not a professional security researcher, if this wasn't obvious. Uh, I haven't been in security for a long time. I've done pen testing, incident response, forensics, lots of things. But not a researcher. Um, if I were, I probably would have realized early on that if you're working with a cloud provider, and you're giving them recommendations, and you're asking them to fix things, and they're going to do it, that's great. But they are definitely going to break your demo. Yeah. Because they're fixing the problems, which is awesome. Um, so I didn't have video at the time. I did, thankfully, think to grab screenshots. So we're going to walk through kind of the claymation version of how this stuff worked. Again, most of it doesn't work anymore, which is cool. Um, so this is a bootstrap site that I set up uh, to demonstrate how it's possible to allow uh, an application, even another site, to impersonate one of these Google applications that we talked about. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, the code is dead simple. So you start by clicking on that. Uh, Button down there on the green side that says the untrusted app. This is kind of our control group for our little experiment, right? And it brings up the untrusted application YOLOware. That's the application that I registered. When you click and ask it to authorize the YOLOware test application, you get an error message. Access blocked. YOLOware has not gone through the validation process. Uh, Google has a pretty uh, strict process for approving applications that want to get access to Drive and email and whatnot, uh, which is a good thing. And uh, I have not put my YOLOware application through that process. Uh, when I registered this application, I got a little client identifier, a secret to help identify it. Uh, when I use that, it doesn't work. Now, if we go back to my website and we click on the red pill, the little red button, right? Now I'm going to execute the same code, but I'm doing it using secrets that I pulled out of these trusted Google applications. And now you go in. You click the Authorize button. There's a giant warning box, of course, that says, hey, I'm about to get access to your data as part of this process. But, and when you do, boop. Now I'm not YOLOware anymore. Now I'm Chrome. That was cool. Uh, the first thing I found was actually not Chrome. It was a different application, Cloud SDK, which you'll see other screenshots later. Um, we did briefly find Chrome. Now, this one was fixed almost immediately. Right? Uh, it shouldn't have been possible, but such as it was. Um, and you go through and you consent. This works all the way through the process. Uh, at the end, because of the way that I do this, and I'll show you what this, how this happens, uh, most of the time in OAuth flows, if you've used them, when you authorize something, your browser just kind of spins in the background real quick. A few URLs go by, and you just get access. In this case, because of the way we're doing it, there's a manual step. Uh, it's a manual step that other applications do use. Collaboratory is one of them, uh, or did at the time, where you have to kind of copy and paste the code back and forth. You do. You authorize it here. And then I think it was just a little box that said, congratulations, it worked. But if you go in the back end, my little server, you can see at the top, right? This is my Python anywhere. That's where I ran this thing. <laughs> uh, a little note at the top that says, ding, authentication was successful. That's the uh, object ID rather than printing credentials and OAuth tokens since those things live forever. Uh, I just dumped the object identifier. And after that's the first of the files that I was listing out of the user. You can see it says, for demo. And voila. You can make a website into Chrome. That's the magic trick. You can be excited about that part. I was excited about that part. You don't have to clap. It's OK. You just be, be, be excited. It's fun. It's an interesting part of the process. Um, and credit to my boss, who was the one who said, you know, 
look, if you want this to really land, you've got you to put a real demo together. Uh, and you should probably use the Chrome one, because I was using Cloud SDK at the time. All right, so let's talk about what just happened. Um, how many people know what just happened, actually? Show of hands. How many people understood what they just saw? <laughs> very few of you. That's good. I don't feel so bad. I didn't either. Um, I very much wanted to understand what was happening, but I didn't really know anything at OAuth at the time. I didn't know anything about uh, Google's workspace security around their APIs. Thankfully, I work at a place that does. Lots of experts knocking about. Uh, and I work for people who value the idea of going to chase this sort of thing down. So I went and found some of the experts, and uh, they pointed me at some, yeah, the RFCs, at the uh, documentation information. It's a little tricky to really get your head all the way around OAuth. Um, this was something they clued me in on earlier, because there are the RFCs, the original RFCs, there's some RFCs that have been added on. There's a bunch of like common practice that isn't really part of the RFCs, and then every implementer kind of does things a little bit differently. So if you want to understand how any one um, OAuth service works, you kind of have to really study that particular implementation. Um, I was kind of hoping it was going to be easier than that, but such is life. Um, so I knocked around a, a lot, but I eventually found uh, uh, this diagram, uh, which is actually from like a beginner's uh, guide to OAuth. And it's, it's my favorite. I found a bunch of others later, but I really like this one, because it lays out all the players that are involved in an OAuth conversation across the top, um, and the steps they have to go through top to bottom. So it's, it's a little easier to follow. OAuth. Uh, as a protocol, is, it, it works very, very well, but it is a little complicated. Partly the way it's part of the reason it's complicated is it's a sort of asynchronous process. You have to, as the user, tell an application that you want to give it access, and then you have to go fetch this like temporary credential for this particular flow. And you have to give that to the application. The application has to do something, and that's all that's being laid out here. Don't worry about squinting too much. We're going to zoom in on it. This is just to give you a mental map so that we can zoom back out occasionally. You'll be able to see what's what's going on. Um, so uh, this, by the way, is a specific flow. There are lots of different ways to um, use OAuth. They call them different flows, different mechanisms, depending on whether you're giving access to an application or you want to register your phone with a site or whatever the case is. Use different kinds of flows. Uh, this is the authorization code flow, and it's a very simple version of it. It's not even a version that's used anymore uh, even by Google, but we're going to walk through the simple version. All right, so let's go back to our venerable consent box. right? Those are those four players across the top, right? Um, and these are all represented in this consent dialogue, right? The user, that's you. You and your browser are considered to be one entity. You're married in the OAuth conversation because every, everything you want to do, you do through your browser, all the consent, everything else, right? So that's you reflected, your identifier. Yeah, that's a real identifier, but I, I made this domain up for this demo. There's nothing there. Don't worry about it. Um, it is, in fact, where YoloWare lives, though. Um, <clears throat> And you have a job to do. You have to decide whether you're going to accept or you know, deny this request. That's your part as a user. We have the client application that's identified front and center up top. That's the big thing that we're focusing on here, the ability to impersonate those clients. There's the authorization server. That's the thing you're talking to to exchange, get that initial ephemeral credential and exchange it for a real token that lives for a long time. Um, and finally, the resource server. That's the thing you want to get access to. And that's reflected down there. In the middle, you see those, those permissions. You're probably familiar with seeing something like those. In this case, we're saying you get to see, edit, create, delete all of your Google Drive files. Google Drive, that's the resource server. And the other things, those are called scopes. You're scoping down the permissions you want to grant this application. So it can't do everything you can do. It can only do the things that you allowed it to do here. Um, to make this handoff work, there's kind of a, there are a bunch of steps. Um, there's one kind of big chunk to get started. Uh, and each of these steps, uh, or each of these chunks, there are controls in place um, baked into the RFC. It doesn't matter which implementation you're talking about for preventing against client impersonation. Right? And we'll identify those as we go. Uh, well, I've been talking a lot about web-based versus client CLI. For the purposes of this demonstration, we're going to use a CLI application uh, because it pauses the process. You don't get all those URLs spinning past. And I can break out for you all the parameters you use. Um, so this is what happens. You fire up a client, whether you're doing it on a uh, web interaction or you're doing it from a command line, a native application. You fire it up, and it's going to point you at an authorization server. Right? How does it know where to point you? Well, it knows because I mentioned earlier registration. Applications that want to use uh, an OAuth resource have to register with the OAuth provider up front. Um, and then that provider will give them a unique identifier, which is spelled out there on the client ID, and some other information. 
So that's the first step. You as a user, the client application, you're talking to each other, you say, app, I wanna give you access. The app says, okay, go over here and go get me one of these ephemeral tokens. So you do, your browser does this, right? And when you do, we hit our first security control. So this is the user now and their browser talking to the authorization server. And you go to this URL, right, with this client ID. And before the authorization server puts that dialog box up, it's supposed to do some things. It's supposed to check whether the response type, the code, is what it expects. It's supposed to check whether the scopes are what, it, what the application registered in the first place. So a malicious application can't suddenly ask for email when it was only ever supposed to have access to your calendar, right? But for the purpose of this conversation, the big thing it has to verify is the redirect URI. Redirect URIs are basically for web-based applications. When you register your application, you say, this is my domain, this is where I'm gonna run my SaaS, whatever web-based application. So when a user comes to get a credential, don't ever send them anywhere except, the, except here. This is to prevent a malicious actor from creating one of these URLs and putting their own malicious domain in with your client identifier, right? That's great. Works very well in a web-based scenario, but we have a problem. Right now, we're not in a web-based scenario. We're in a command line application or an installed application, something on your phone, right? So what do we do? Any guesses? Where do you redirect people when they're on their local machine and they need to access a networked resource? Any guesses? Come on. How do computers refer to themselves? Somebody's got to have the shirt, no? All right. Loopx, localhost. Loopback interface is a specialized network interface that runs on a machine, and it's there basically for the machine to be able to talk to itself and refer to itself. So this is how you do redirect URIs, or supposed to, for native applications. There are some problems with this as well, and they're, they're contemplated elsewhere, but we're gonna put those to the side for today because there is a bigger issue, which is that's not what we did. And I noticed this. This is not a localhost redirect. This is some weird string I'd never seen before. So I checked it out. And it was a little weird. I will warn you, you can't unsee this bit. <clears throat> so what does that redirect to your, your I decode to? It decodes to this string, URN IETF WGO auth 2.0. I'm just gonna read this. I don't usually read off my slides, but I'm going to here because I can't do this any more justice than it's spelled out. This value indicates that Google's authorization server should return the authorization code in the browser's title bar. Now, I don't know how many of you have ever been involved in developing a secure message passing or credential storage system. Um, I don't know if you ever thought, you know where we should put that? Put it in the browser title bar, right? That being said, and it's easy for me to make the joke, right, and in hindsight, but this is actually solving a real problem. Um, it took me a little while to find it out, because uh, again, since it said IETF to GEO auth right in the thing, I assumed this meant it was part of the spec, but I couldn't find it anywhere. Um, so I knocked around and I found eventually the post from one of the folks who co-wrote, uh, if I remember correctly, the OAuth for Native Apps RFC. Um, this is an excerpt of the post. You should go look at it yourself. Don't take my word for it. Remember? Trust. Know what you're trusting. Don't trust me. Look it up. Um, and he talks about this. He says, no, 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 it's not part of the spec. We're not going to add it. This is a specific thing. Uh, and it's really not something people should use without understanding the security implications of doing so. Because what we just heard, right, is that's a static string. Authorization servers are supposed to validate redirect URIs, but you can't do that if every client is using the same redirect URI. They always validate, right? So if you're using this, you've knocked out one of the controls against client impersonation. Now, he also says, I don't really want to put effort into expanding all the reasons it's not secure. Yeah, I, I wish I could, but I don't have time to do it either. You'll have to accept it for now on faith. But there, there was a real problem they were trying to solve at the time, as I understand it, uh, which had to do with like, Windows machines, uh, local firewalls blocking redirects to loopbacks. Um, and it happens to be Windows scripting, apparently you can read title bars for other windows that the user's got open. So uh, it is a clever hack, I have to say. Uh, obviously, it's got weird security implications, but you can understand, you know, we're trying to solve a hard problem. All right, so we've gotten through our first chunk, and we've gotten through our first security control against client impersonation. We beat the redirect, redirect URI. Okay, so now, assuming uh, that the authorization server validates everything else, it brings up one of these consent dialogues that we've seen before. Now you and the authorization server are still talking to each other, and you click OK, and as we saw, you get this instruction to copy the code back. Now, the interesting thing about this from like a phishing perspective, for example, is everything we've seen so far is all valid infrastructure, right? This is a valid consent dialog box. It's not a malicious URL. 
If you tell your users to look for one, they're not gonna find it. This is legit. The redirect is legit. Everything about this is a legitimate, valid URL. I'm not doing anything with infrastructure. All I'm doing is tricking it into behaving like a different application. Uh, so all the traditional guidance you give people about phishing doesn't necessarily hold. Yeah, there's the initial web server that's running that's malicious, but uh, it doesn't have to be a web server. You could run it on cloud infrastructure somewhere if you wanted to. But the whole rest of it, when you click the accept, you don't even put a password in, right? You might ask your user, did you put your password in if they think they got phished? No, no, I didn't. I just clicked the box. All right, you're probably fine. They're not fine, I assure you. Uh, so assuming you go back through there, you get that code. Um, the user has to copy it across. It's an extra hop for this particular attack. There are other ways to do it that don't evolve, I think, but it's cleaner to, to demonstrate it this way. Um, so then the application has to get involved. The application has to exchange that credential for this long-term token it needs. That's what happens down at the bottom. So now we have the client app and the authorization server. You as the user, you're out of the, you're out of the mix. Your browser's not involved anymore here. Now the application that you wanted to authorize, be it a web-based application that got the code via redirect, or a local application that you copied and pasted or did a local host redirect, it has to go visit the authorization server and exchange that ephemeral temporary credential for a permanent token. They call it refresh tokens, and they also get an access token, uh, temporary access to the resource. And it's that thing that they use to access Drive or Box or LinkedIn, you know, whatever your provider is, right? Um, and so this is where we hit the last of our uh, security controls, or the second of our security controls, excuse me. So the first we had the redirect URI, and now we have client secret validation. So when the application goes to cache that ephemeral token in, it ha uh, the ephemeral string in, it has something else, the client secret. That secret's given to it by the authorization server way back in the beginning when we talked about registration. The authorization server gives it a unique secret. That's its password, basically, to authenticate itself. Okay, so it has that secret and it has to use that secret when it's talking to the authorization server to refresh, to exchange for its token. Again, this works great in a web-based scenario. At this point, can anybody spot what the problem is if you've got a locally installed client? Any reverse engineers? Come on. All right, you're being a quiet bunch all out. Uh, the problem here with an installed application is that you're running it in your execution environment. It's not in a trusted, SaaS hosted, ironed out thing. You have access to the application. You know everything the application knows, including the application secret. You can't protect secrets from the user who's, who's using them, right? It doesn't really work that way. Um, and these are pretty easy to find. So uh, like I said, we found Cloud SDK originally, um, and then went knocking about. I was hoping there was only one, and then I thought, well, I should probably keep looking look around, and we found others. We found them in source code repositories. We found them in a few other places. Um, there's one actually in the BigQuery book, the BigQuery CLI, in the BigQuery book by Jordan, the, like the BigQuery guy, right? Lays this out. But this is it was really interesting. It sort of, I think, uh, sheds a bit of light on, on how the story might have come out. And it's where you start to see that, while well, this seems a little nuts, like this is totally something that could happen in just about anywhere, any company, right? Uh, so he publishes these things, and he says, look, yeah, they're secrets, but these aren't really secret, right? Yes, if somebody uh, gains access to these things, they can impersonate your client, but in this case, these aren't special clients. We're not going to trust them. Like, they, don't, they get no special privileges. Um, I think he said in a mailing this post somewhere, they only use them to like, figure out what applications for marketing purposes or, or research purposes or, or people are using in order to access BigQuery. So they're not going to trust them, right? And that's important. That's a clear understanding of what the security issues are. Yeah, okay, fine, you're gonna do these things, but you're not gonna trust the app. And that's called out in the RFC itself. So the RFC, one of the RFCs contemplates this problem. In the case that an authorization server requires a secret for a native application, an installed application, it recommends you don't do this, by the way. It says, don't put a key there. If you do, someday, somebody might think it's important and relevant, and it's not. But if you insist on doing so, just make sure that you continue to treat it as a public, untrusted client. It would be dangerous to indicate to end users the trustworthiness of the client. So this is fine. Right? Back to our earlier point, understanding what you trust. This is fine as long as you don't ever trust those native applications. Ah. But it's not fine if you do. So let's talk about what the trust looks like for this particular case. 
Um, and it extends pretty far. So once you get past that process of validation, so we, we talked earlier already about this initial check screen, right? When I'm running code with my secret, I get blocked. When I'm running code with one of these Google secrets, I don't get blocked. I pass through the validation process, and I can authorize, right? If uh, a user wants to go check the applications that have access to it, once we've gone through that consent process, that token that the application's using, that is the impersonated application for all intents and purposes. It's the cloud SDK or Chrome or whatever to the user. It's the cloud SDK to the enterprise administrator, which you'll see in a minute. It's the cloud SDK to Google. When they present this information, they, in the, uh, uh, you know, like my security settings of your account, right, you can see what apps have access to your data, which, by the way, is an awesome feature. I like this. Um, and they divide the world into two buckets, the dirty, dirty third-party applications that you might not trust, and then the applications on the other side, which it says are trusted apps by Google. Don't install, uninstall these unless you don't use them anymore. Right? When I use the key in my malicious application, that's where I show up. That's pretty much it for end users, because um, they don't have access to logging or other things, really. Uh, there's a little bit of uh, authorization information now where it shows you kind of last authentication or authorization to your account. Right? Um, these things show up there now. I think they used to be a little spottier, but, but they do now, which is nice. Uh, but other than that, it's kind of it for end users, right? But there are enterprises um, who might also be interested in being able to lock these things out. Um, and there are controls Google provides that are pretty rich for dealing with API access, right? There's the ability to block. Remember, we had those dirty, dirty third-party applications. As an administrator in a domain, you can say, I don't want my users to use any of those applications. I don't trust any of them. But that is an ACL based on the OAuth identifier. Right? Um, and notably, for these particular applications, it doesn't affect the set of apps, uh, because they're not considered third party. They're first party applications. Um, you can also choose to trust, if you want to, just your company's internal applications, but that doesn't matter much. Um, there is a place, or there was at the time, a spot that like, individual first party applications are listed out. And you can choose to enable or disable those. Drive is up here, for example, which is one of the early things that we ran into. Um, uh, drive for desktop, excuse me, like the syncing application. Um, although I'll say when I <laughs> first found that one, it confused the heck out of me because I thought the consent dialog was saying Google Drive wants access to Google Drive. And I kept thinking, why are you asking me? It seems like something you should just be able to do. Uh, but it turns out it was the client they were talking about. I, I had misread it. But in any case, uh, the applications that we're talking about don't show up here. There's no, no place to turn those off. Um, but there is one more spot. It's so very deep, deep, deep down in the console. There's this like firewall, old school firewallish kind of interface where you can specify individual OAuth IDs if you know what they are, or if you know the name, you can look it up as well, right? Um, so you can do like in that previous screen, for example, if you wanted to say I want to allow all applications, but there's a couple that I don't like, or I want to deny all of them, but there's a couple I want to allow, you can do it here. Right? right. So you can put the application in, you get the little identifier. And you can specify whether you want to allow or block that thing. Perfect. Click Submit. But that doesn't work. There's some kind of hard-coded thing, uh, a result, property of these applications. You can't block them in this interface. You just get a fail. It says try again later, but it just doesn't work. Um, I don't think this is actually, I, I have no idea if this was even intentional. It could just be a side effect of however it was implemented. Who knows? But the end result of all these things is, if you are an enterprise administrator, you're relying on those OAuth identifiers as part of your access control lists, then regardless of what you do, you can turn all those things off, you lock it down, put everything up to 11, short of turning the little switch that says disable drive altogether. When I use a secret, I can get in with these applications, or I could at the time. Um, uh, I also referenced in the description kind of anti-forensics incident response. So I, I cut my teeth doing incident response and forensics work years ago. Um, long time ago, actually, <laughs> at this point. Uh, so this is actually just a re-screenshot of the thing that we saw earlier, um, the kind of console that you'd look at, but it's probably something your IR team might rely on as well, right? User calls and says, hey, I think I might have gotten fished or we might have an incident. Our team's going to say, all right, well, go in here, look for any suspicious applications. Maybe they've looked themselves. But again, the applications don't show up as anything suspicious. And it promulgates all the way down to the logs. This is a log export. Uh, came out of our system. I think these are actually our field names. I don't know that these map to the original field names. But um, So everywhere that this is recorded, even in the logs, it presents itself as 
one of these trusted, valid, first-party applications. And I can tell you, you know, I, I did IR for a long time. I did monitoring for a long time. If you've got applications like this um, that a lot of people might be using, Chrome, the cloud SDK that I keep referring to, uh, if people know, administer their um, GCP infrastructure with a G Cloud command, that, that's this thing. That's what this is. Right? So you're going to see this pinged all the time. You're probably going to put an allow list in for your anomaly detection or some such, or, or tune it down a little. Right? Um, so it can mess with your ability to detect, to do investigations if you're not paying attention. You do still get IP address and other things here, so there's, there's some hope, but it certainly provides a mechanism for an attacker to cover their tracks a bit. Um, and I think not covered here, I can go into the potential uh, threat actors, but um, because it's not specific to this problem, it's just a property of OAuth and OAuth kind of attack, so not specific to Google at all, is that those OAuth credentials, again, those things, those tokens, um, their authorization layer, their post-authentication. So again, password resets have no effect on OAuth tokens. So if a user thinks they got phished, you reset their password, attacker still has access, right? Um, they go to check, validate in their list of applications, attacker still has access. Uh, again, not a Google thing, that's just so off. That's the way it is. Um, so let's talk through some threat actors, threat scenarios. Obviously, there's generic external threat agents. Um, one thing to note, I've been talking about Drive a lot. That's because that's the thing that I found. Um, I haven't looked at all at any applications that do this for Gmail. The, the bar for uh, apps that have access to emails is even higher than Drive applications. Um, is the verification process I mentioned earlier is actually pretty onerous uh, for both scenarios. You have to like send in a description of your app, and you have to like record a YouTube video of how it's going to work and what you're going to do with all the scopes. It's like it's a pretty big deal. Um, so, I, I, for all I know, there aren't anything that can get access to to Gmail. This is just Drive we've been largely talking about. But still, interesting potentially for an external attacker. Although if they can't re email out, maybe a little less. Mischievous users, insider threats, absolutely. Right? If you know that there's an application running around, if you're just a mischievous user who's annoyed because the security team won't let you use your favorite application, well, you just throw in this secret if it lets you. And I've seen documentation for applications online that talk about doing this. Hey, if you're having trouble getting our app working, use this client ID in secret. <laughs> uh, so I don't know how many like, database connectors or whatever else are running around out there that use these identifiers, but there are a bunch. Um, and then beyond mischievous users, real insider threats. If you're, if you're trying to protect against people exfiltrating information from inside the company, you're using these OAuth-based access control lists, again, here or anywhere else, lots of other providers, not just Google, use OAuth identifiers to build, to build ACLs, and they do not necessarily express to people, I haven't seen any, in fact, that do, the difference between an OAuth identifier that belongs to a native application and one that belongs to a trusted hosted application. It's, just, it's totally opaque, so you don't know when you're trusting what you're actually saying. So, insider threats, this is great, right? Now I can get data out. To that extent, pen testers. Is there any red teamers in the room? You got a client site? Yeah. And they're a Google shop, and they've locked a bunch of things down, and you need a staging ground or a way to push data out? This, is, this will probably work. Um, if you're a better developer than me, you might even be able to get the current version working. I couldn't in the short time, but who knows, right? Uh, but I don't worry about any of those folks quite as much as the last category. I mean, we worry about insider threat. I worry about insider threat. It's a big part of our security model. Um, but this last category made me a little jumpy. It's part of why we really pushed and part of why we talked to some folks quietly. Uh, target attackers. So like I said, I, I did a lot of incident response in my time, uh, sometimes dealing with you know, advanced persistent threats or whatever other mism we want to use. Um, and there is a certain class of attacker where this specific combination of capabilities, the ability to pull off a pretty convincing phishing attack, the ability to quietly monitor what a user is doing without them knowing, to show up as a trusted uh, party and cover your tracks, the ability to maintain access past the traditional mechanisms for recovery in the event of account compromise. There are some very specific people who do scary things that would like that particular set of credentials and would not mind the extra hop of having to get somebody to put code somewhere in. Um, that being said, I have not seen any of these things in the wild. Um, I have not heard of any of them in the wild, except what I mentioned earlier about like tricky websites or whatnot that are just trying to get their apps running and don't feel like going through the registration process. I've seen a bunch of those, but um, I haven't seen any actual malicious activity. I used to work at places, big global shops. I spent a lot of time in higher ed and healthcare. 
uh, big, fast computers, global networks, hundreds of thousands of machines and users, right? So I used to have a lot more visibility into what was happening on the internet. Uh, now I just see what we see. I haven't seen any of this stuff yet. Um, and a few people, I've, I've talked to a few people here and there, and I haven't, haven't heard of anybody else mentioning it either. All right, so we're going to wrap up. Um, they mentioned this at the beginning. For the folks who want to head out now, because I know lunch is starting soon, you feel free. Don't let me stop you. Uh, but I'm not going to move to the wrap room, which is what they do in most talks. I'll be doing Q&A here. So if you want to ask me questions, and you're welcome to, uh, stick around. If you do, if you ask me a question or you tell me something, if either of us learns anything from our interaction, it's a core part of being at Two Sigma. We value learning and studying. So if we learn something from our interaction, you can have one of these fancy, fancy decks of Two Sigma playing cards. While supplies last, I have 20. I can't imagine I'll get 20 questions, but if I do, great. And you don't have to ask him here if I'm in the bar or in the hallway or wherever else. I'm happy to give away playing cards. I don't have to bring them back in the plane. Uh, all right, so let's wrap up. So again, I know I had a few, you know, had a few jabs here or there. This is not just Google. Very much not just Google. Right? Other providers did, maybe still do, I don't know, trust that out of band URI, that abomination of a URI string that we talked about earlier. Right? Definitely other people who do that. Lots of providers use OAuth identifiers, again, for the basis of access control lists. That is trust. If you're putting something into an access control list, you are lending it trust. And I, again, have not seen any instances where it's made clear to the people who are using those systems that the access control list can contain things that they shouldn't ever trust and things that they should. Right? This is not a Google problem. A lot of people problem, it's you problem. If you're a security professional, you're an engineer, you're designing these things, you have to understand how this stuff works. Not just OAuth specifically in this case, because you know, this will go away and there'll be five more things that look like it, I'm sure, next month. Um, but any time you get assertions about controls, access control lists, this can stop this, we have this to prevent that, uh, you, you got to ask, you got to push, you got to understand how it's implemented, do some critical thinking, ask some hard questions. Uh, one of the things I like to do when I'm trying to suss this stuff out is I phrase uh, an attack I'm trying to pull off as a feature for a vendor. And I say, hey, I've got a user who's trying to do this. Can you make this happen? And sometimes the sales engineers are good at tracking that stuff down for you <laughs> if you need them to. Um, but not just externally, too. With your partners, you need to do this stuff. With your own folks, you need to do this stuff. You've got to track down. You've got to understand what those controls are. Treat every control, every assertion that's made to you in documentation and anywhere else in the console as a hypothesis that you have to test always. And I know I kept referencing the secrets. People would be mad at me if I didn't put them up, so here they are. Again, really, this doesn't work anymore for the most part. Uh, there are various mitigations to these things. Um, in some cases, it was just pulling support. Actually, I should say uh, globally, Google's pulled support for the out-of-band URI, that, that awful URI that we talked about earlier. Um, so none of the applications support that anymore. If you try and use any application with that URI, it'll fail. This is awesome. Very good news. Um, but really, the core problem is the trust. That's just an attack path. The problem is always that you trust the application. I think all of these things, even I think actually in the Cloud SDK, because I was yeah, reviewing the materials in the last week or so, and I think the Cloud SDK actually even shows up in third-party apps now in the console. So even that isn't quite as privileged as it used to be, which is nice. Um, again, most of these things don't work anymore, but these are the client IDs and secrets, and I have no idea if this is the full list. Probably isn't. I can't imagine that me, doing what I do, found everything. Right? This list exists. It's trusted. You have to know that. You have to understand that that's true when you're making your own security decisions, your own implementations. So that's it. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I did. Thank you all for being here with me. If you want to know more, please stay, ask me questions, find me in the hallway. Uh, this is my contact information. You're welcome to reach out. Uh, happy to help however I can. And uh, yeah, it's my first time doing one of these at Black Hat, so this is kind of exciting. Thank you all for being here. <laughs> Cheers. Questions, if you have one, step up, go to the mic, ask. Oh, there's somebody at the front, I don't think he's hot. Can you? I can also speak oh, up. Good. <laughs> good. So that makes the whole ACL concept invalid, basically, for this OAuth. Like, you can never really trust 
the secrets, the whole process Google has for making sure that you are responsible with Google Drive if you access it doesn't make sense then, right? Um, I, I wouldn't go quite that far for what it's worth. Uh, I, I did at some point. I went through various phases in this process, uh, most of them fueled by bourbon. Um, <laughs> uh, and I wouldn't go quite that far. Um, one, again, I want to emphasize, not just a Google problem. Yeah, not just, lots, okay. lots of providers trust native applications when they shouldn't. Um, but yes, it severely weakens the meaning of those controls. Right? What, it, what it means is you're trusting anybody who has access to that particular set of secrets in the scenario in which one of these attacks can be pulled off, you know, copying the credential across or whatever else. Right? So you, get, you have to move away from the it is secure or it isn't secure and into the, all right, we've got to think through the specific threat scenarios that we're talking about and whether or not this access control, given these conditions, is going to be effective there. And if it's not, how do we have to patch it ourselves with monitoring or whatever else? Right? Um, but I hear you. I, to I totally get it. Like, you look at it, you're like, I, this is all useless now. <laughs> it isn't necessarily. Right? Like, I've seen lots of people try and do authorizations with malicious applications. They, they fail all the time. Right? So it's working. But yeah, I hear you. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Yeah. Um, does implementing Pixie do anything to stop this? Oh, that's great. Somebody asked about Pixie. So I didn't have time to put it in the show. Uh, <laughs> but now I get to talk about it. This is great. So there are actually a lot of references. Pixie's like the, the new thing. It's literally like Pixie dust uh, for OAuth people. <laughs> you sprinkle it on old flows, and it makes them better. Um, uh, and it's, it, it's, it actually is really good. So what Pixie does. Um, and you can find documentation online. The article talks about the, the way you deal with exposed secrets in clients and this problem um, is to use Pixie. Uh, it's only sort of true. It's true in the scenario of mobile applications. So the way Pixie works is it removes the static secret out of a client application and it replaces it with, do you, do you know the answer? What does it replace it with? Yeah, it, it, re <laughs> it replaces it with literally anything you want. That value is made up by the application at the time of the specific interaction. That's what Pixie does. So you take a string, right? you hash it, you base64 encode it, and you pass it along with your request. And then when you as the client go to exchange your token after, you feed the raw value. Right? This sort of challenge response thing. We do this all the time, lots of places. You feed the raw value to Google, and it can validate that the raw value that you gave it matches secret up front. But again, that doesn't protect against this particular problem, because now you can literally just use any secret you want. Not the valid client secret, right? Um, the scenario protects against for what it's worth, and we're going to swim out of my depth real quick. But as I understand it, is like places like mobile applications where you might be able to hook like half of a conversation. And so what you want to do is validate that the application that initiated the conversation is the same one that's involved in the second half, so that somebody didn't get to man in the middle of that. Um, and for that threat scenario, Pixie's perfect. And probably a bunch of others that I don't know about, because I don't understand the uh, don't understand all of it, but um, yeah, that's what it does. Pixie replaces, as I understand it, the client secret with a value, or it doesn't necessarily replace it. It says this in the documentation. It says you can add this on. You can still use a client secret, but yeah. So no, unfortunately, not for this scenario. Yeah. Oh, sorry, you're standing. I was listening to the answer. Uh, yeah, that's fine. Other questions? Yeah, I got one. I don't think this mic's on, though. So, you know, a lot of this is talking about OAuth, but we have other things like, you know, Okta and uh, all sorts of other kind of authentication authorization frameworks. It almost seems like this could be something that is looked at in all of them. Uh, I think so. I'll, I'll repeat in case anybody in the back couldn't hear. So the, the question was, uh, there's, there's lots of other authorization frameworks, and this feels like the kind of problem that might crop up in other places. Yeah, probably. I'm, I'm not really, <laughs> to be honest with you, I'm not an IAM guy. I never was. I only learned it to figure out what the hell was going on here. Um, but yeah, I agree. But if you have an instinct on it, again, this, this whole thing started, I used to have the slide on it, but I took it out, because I clicked a button in, in Colab, and when it asked for access to Drive, it said, the first time Google Drive wants access to Google Drive, and then it said the cloud SDK wants access. I was like, I don't know what's happening here, but I'm pretty confident that an application is not supposed to say it's something else when it's trying to get access to my stuff. That's all I knew, right? And then I had to kind of go off from there. So if you spot something like this, yeah, go out, check it out, bang against it. Let me know. I'd, I'd be super curious to hear what you find. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, you said that Google isn't using these, trusting these client secrets for authorization anymore, but are they still trusting it for their metrics, and could you mess with their metrics using these? Darn if I know. Don't work there. <laughs> Probably at this point, never will. <laughs> I don't expect they're going to get any offers anytime soon. Um, <laughs> uh, I have no idea. But honestly, that kind of doesn't matter. I mean, yeah, maybe you could screw around with usage metrics, but you know, as the, they said in the book earlier on, you know, I imagine it's not something to be super concerned about. But it's a fair point. Yeah, you probably could. And I don't, um, and uh, I shouldn't just miss it out of hand. I, I, really, there, there could be lots of other, if we generalize that question to, are there other downstream situations in which this could be problematic? I assume the answer is yes. These are the ones that I can see. I have no idea what things look like in the back end. Right? I generally have no specialized knowledge of how this is implemented, or what Google does or doesn't do. Um, I do know that as a user, they've got lots of uh, like detection capabilities and whatnot for like targeted attackers. Um, when I was in this game, I used to like my account used to go off every once in a while and be like, "Hey, somebody's screwing with you." <laughs> All right, good to know. Thank you. Um, so those folks might pick up this kind of thing, even if the attacker is valid. I, I have no idea. You uh, mentioned that they've invalidated these local hosts uh, attributes of the URM that they can't be used anymore. Yep. Do you know how are, does that mean that like a, a CLI command to log in wouldn't work anymore at all or have they come up with a new solution for that? They've come up with solutions in various places. Some of them might be here, but they're probably hiding. Yeah. You can ask one of them. Um, but uh, yeah, so the Cloud SDK now, so G Cloud still has to work, right? We can't make G Cloud not work anymore. Let's be honest. I think this vulnerability is cool. I do not want G Cloud to stop working across the planet. Like, I can't imagine what would happen, right? So uh, when you use G Cloud now and you pass it the special flag that says don't launch the browser, do something else, uh, it'll operate in a couple of modes, one of which is it just tells you to go execute it on a different machine that has internet access, and then it does the browser-based OAuth. But there is another version that still allows you to do a code copy across. It just doesn't use that URL. It uses a sort of proxy authentication and another online URI. That URI is also static, um, so it also kind of can't be validated, but I haven't made this work yet. Um, it uses Pixie 2, so you have to be able to throw one of those values on. Um, I haven't made it work in my demo yet. Uh, so uh, I should note, a lot of the stuff you have to do manually, because most of the client libraries aren't designed to let you do this kind of crap, because <laughs> you're never supposed to do it. Right? So if you use any of the default libraries and you just like call the auth handler, it, it'll fail because it doesn't expect you to do this. So you have to like, construct the URIs manually, basically, to, to get it to do something. Um, and again, I, I haven't made it work yet, but uh, I'm not a security researcher by trade, and I'm not a particularly good software engineer, so I'm sure somebody else could probably figure it out. Um, but again, that just does the, the authorization. So yeah, maybe the, you could still get it to authorize, but if it's listed as a third-party application and it's no longer trusted in first party, again, the trust is the problem. Um, oh, I'm not so worried about it. Then I can block it in my admin domain. I can, I can do all kinds of things. Right. Other questions? All right. Well, for the last 20 of you or so that hung out, thanks for hanging in. Uh, come find me wherever you want. Cheers.